Good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. Paul's worship service this morning. We're glad you're with us wherever you're uh, viewing from on this lovely summer day. Uh, we're sorry we couldn't meet together outside. Um, there were a few health concerns and leadership thought it prudent to uh, just be cautious. So we're glad you're with us. Thanks for joining today. Our invocation this morning comes from Psalm 37, uh, verse, starting in verse 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Before you called it to be, you were the king of kings, and you were, and you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cried out, we join them as they sing, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever, glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name. All my days, all my days, so let my whole life be a blazing offering. A life that shouts and sings the riches of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life, let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life, let it be yours. We'll sing in glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. We're singing glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe In this broken generation all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation. We believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus. 
Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. He's coming back again. We believe. Let our faith be more than anthems Greater than the songs we sing And in our weakness and temptations We believe We believe We believe in God the Father We believe we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that I conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. He's coming back again. Let the lost be found and the dead be raised. In the here and now, let love in faith. Let the church live loud, our God will say, we believe, we believe, and the gates of hell will not prevail, for the power of God has torn the veil, and we know your love will never fail, we believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. He's coming back again. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. He's coming back again. We believe. Mm -hmm. We believe. Chains of the past, broken at last, I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus I could I want more. Receive nothing but goodness. Tested and tasted your grace. I was so lost that I fell at the cross and got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus after now one more. The love of God gave me his pardon. The love of God 
won't let me see the same. The love of God calls me up higher. His will is stronger. It's why I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. Got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. How could I want more? I'm undone by the mercy. Jesus, undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. How could I want more? Amen. Hey, Ryan. Hello, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Looking forward to what you have to say today, Wes. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, St. Paul's. Um, I apologize for the uh, unexpected change in plans last minute. Uh, for those of you who have been joining us for in-person worship, I know there's about 30 of you and uh, I have enjoyed uh, getting to see your faces or at least half of your faces. And we really do hope that we will be able to return to in-person worship next week. Um, but uh, we'll be sending out uh, a message about that to, to let you guys know uh, what's going on. Hopefully you saw the message uh, that we sent out. If you didn't, uh, you know that uh, both Keith and I have had somebody at home uh, who has had a fever this week. Um, and so we just want to be very uh, cautious right now not to put anybody at risk. Um, uh, Sarah has had a very mild fever for several days now, but yesterday it crossed that 100 barrier. And uh, so we thought, well, this is something we, we need to take seriously. So um, she's going to be tested for COVID this afternoon. And we're, we're very hopeful that it won't be COVID. Um, I heard recently that only, well, less than 1% of the tests that are being done uh, for COVID are coming back positive in Connecticut right now. So the odds are uh, in her, her favor. And if it comes back negative, then um, we'll be meeting in person again next week. Um, but we just wanted to be, to be safe. So I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, so our passage for this morning is, I think, one of the most comforting things that Jesus ever said. Uh, if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn to Matthew 11, starting in verse 25. Matthew 11, uh, verse 25. Whether we have been Christians our entire lives, uh, whether we just became Christians recently, or even if we're still trying to figure out uh, what we believe, uh, I believe that we should hear an invitation in these words, a personal invitation to each one of us. So listen to what Jesus says. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it very reassuring who Jesus calls to him here. Right? He doesn't say, come to me, all of you who are righteous and upstanding, or come to me, all of you who are intelligent and, and smart. Uh, come to me, all of you who haven't made a mess out of your lives. No, he says, come to me, all of you who are weary, who are burdened. Come to me, those of you who need relief, those of you who have made a mess out of your lives, those of you who are exhausted by the world, I can help. Do you feel weary and burdened this morning? I don't think that we can live too long in this world without eventually feeling um, weary and burdened. Uh, right now, many of us are weary uh, of the pandemic and the disruptions to normal living that it's caused. Uh, I know that I, for one, am feeling tired, uh, like 
there's a risk of getting sick or making somebody else sick every single time that I'm close to somebody. Uh, I'm tired of feeling like every decision in action is more complicated because of COVID. Uh, that's very frustrating. But with or without COVID, life can leave us feeling weary and, and burdened. I'm reminded of last year around this time when we looked at the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, hopefully some of you remember that. Ecclesiastes was written by a privileged, wealthy person. Uh, but as he reflected on his life, he felt burdened. He felt weary. Uh, he said, uh, reflecting on the condition of humanity, what a heavy burden that God has laid on men. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun all of them are meaningless. That is a actual quote uh, from the Bible. Uh, all, he said, all of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And uh, you might remember when we studied that book last year that that word meaningless literally translated means uh, vapor. So what the teacher of Ecclesiastes uh, was saying is that everything in life is like vapor. It's passing. It's like trying to grab onto smoke. And that puts a heavy burden on human beings because as the author of Ecclesiastes also said, God has set eternity in the hearts of men, uh, which means that we long for permanence, right? We long for our work to yield something lasting. Uh, we long for a sense that we're not just going around in circles, but that we're actually progressing towards something greater in life. But what actually happens in life? Well, what happens is that our work fades, right? The barns that we build today eventually rot a few decades later. The cars that we produce and that we buy, they eventually rust. The institutions that we create, they are often left behind as the world changes. And of course, most importantly, uh, we all age and die. And the writer, the writer of Ecclesiastes reflected on this and he said, this is a heavy burden that has been laid on all of us. Basically, we long for things that the world can't give us. A word that I hear used a lot these days is dehumanizing. Uh, people will refer to certain uh, words or policies or ideologies as dehumanizing. And what they mean is that those things deprive people of peace and well-being and respect. And a lot of the ideologies and words and policies that people refer to as dehumanizing are in fact dehumanizing and should be referred to that way. Um, but it occurred to me as I was thinking about uh, this passage in Ecclesiastes this week, that even if we could eradicate every dehumanizing uh, practice, ideology, word, uh, life would still feel dehumanizing because of what the author of Ecclesiastes is talking about. Because the world, reality, does not respect our desire not to age, not to get sick, not to die, uh, the world that we're living in doesn't respect the fact that we, we want whatever we do, whatever work we do to last. Uh, whatever we work to create will still eventually uh, break down. So a sense of weariness and burden is not a unreasonable response to life. And that is true whether we are well off by worldly standards or not. Um, if we're not well off, if we lack things in life that we want, you know, things like money, romance, health, success, social acceptance. Uh, if we lack those things, then of course we can feel weary and burdened. But then even if we have those things, we can still feel weary and burdened because of the work that goes into maintaining and preserving those things. And because if we're uh, aware of the realities of the world, we also need to recognize that eventually the, we lose these things. You know, eventually we age and we pass away. Um, so like the, like the writer of Ecclesiastes said, we're chasing after the wind. And, and the order of this world, the order of the natural world is dehumanizing. 
Now, I know I sound really depressing right now. I don't mean to depress us, but what I'm trying to help us to see is that whoever we are, uh, regardless of how successful or how fulfilled we feel in this given moment, Jesus's invitation here is something that all of us need. If you don't feel like you need it right now, you're going to feel like you need it later. Uh, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now that raises the question, what is a yoke? Uh, what's that talking about? Well, a yoke is a wooden beam uh, that has two loops in it. Um, I had a drawing of one that I was going to hold up, but I left it in the other room. Uh, but anyway, you probably know what it is. It's uh, the oxen, oxen or some sort of beast of burden uh, will put their neck through the holes in the yoke. And when two oxen or two animals are both yoked together, they're stuck together and they're both uh, doing the same job, you know, pulling the same cart or, or whatever. So when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, he's saying, attach yourself to me and join me in the work that I'm doing. Attach yourself to me and join me in the work that I'm doing. Now, here's something that's very important for us to notice. The rest that Jesus is offering us, it only comes when we put on Jesus's yoke, right? A lot of us want the rest, but we don't want to put on the yoke. But the rest does not come unless we put on the yoke. Now, what does it mean to put on Jesus's yoke? Well, think about it. If you're an ox and you put on the yoke that another ox is wearing, uh, now you're not the only one who gets to decide where you're going or what you're doing, right? To, to put on a yoke is to give up autonomy. It's to lose control and give control over to the one that you're yoked to. If you are handcuffed to another person, are you the only one who gets to decide where you're going or what you're doing? No, right? So what Jesus is saying here is, do you want peace? Do you want relief from the burdens of this world? Well, here's what you need to do. You need to let me be the Lord of your life. You need to let me be in control. Uh, if I go to the left, you need to go to the left. If I go to the right, you need to go to the right. If I'm doing a particular job, you need to join me in that job. But this is very counterintuitive for us because we tend to think if we want peace, the way to do it is to be Lord of our own lives, right? We tend to think, uh, if I get to call all the shots, then I'll be at peace. If I get to decide what's right and wrong for me, well, then I'll be at peace. Then I'll be happy. But Jesus says, no, no, no. You're never going to have rest that way. You're never going to have the rest for your soul that you long for unless you give up control to me, unless you attach yourself to me and move where I move. You have to put my yoke upon you. Some of us, we don't feel rest. And we look at this passage and we think, Jesus promises rest. And I've been a Christian uh, for years, and I just don't feel this rest that Jesus is talking about. And if that's you, I would say one question you do need to ask yourself is, am I putting on Jesus's yoke? You know, every day, am I saying uh, to Jesus, I want to move where you move. I want to surrender control of my life and give it to you. And if we can't honestly say that, then we shouldn't expect that we'll be experiencing the peace and rest that Jesus offers, because the peace and rest doesn't come without the yoke. I once heard a saying, and I wish I could give the person who said it credit, uh, but I can't remember where I heard it, but it's stuck in my brain. And uh, it was this, 
Jesus came, among other reasons, to remove the melancholy burden of living for yourself. Jesus came, among other reasons, to remove the melancholy burden of living for yourself. See, we might think that living for ourselves is true freedom, but it's actually a melancholy burden because our souls were not designed to feel satisfaction from selfish living. Um, St. Augustine once said, this is a very famous quote from him, very true. Uh, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. If we want rest for our souls, we need to put on Jesus's yoke. We need to attach ourselves to him and move where he moves. Now let's talk a little bit more about that yoke. When we let Jesus be the Lord of our lives, when we put on that yoke, where does he lead us? Uh, does he work us in the field nonstop in the hot sun, uh, never giving us a break? Does he force us to carry burdens that are impossible to carry? What's it like when we yoke ourselves to him? Well, Jesus says, no, I am not a harsh uh, yoke partner. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, why does Jesus say that? Well, in those days, a rabbi's interpretation of the law could be referred to as a yoke. Uh, different rabbis had different interpretations. And if you were a follower of that rabbi, you could describe yourself as putting on the yoke of that rabbi because you were basically moving where that rabbi moved. And um, a lot of the rabbis of Jesus's day had these very burdensome interpretations of the Mosaic law. For example, uh, the law said, do not work on the Sabbath. And some rabbis would then create these very burdensome laws to ensure that people didn't get anywhere close to doing anything remotely like work on the Sabbath. So they would say things like, well, you shouldn't tear a piece of cloth on the Sabbath or light a fire on the Sabbath, because these are activities that could be construed in some contexts as work. You don't want to get anywhere close to doing work on the Sabbath, lest you break the law. And so you have to follow all of these rules. This is why uh, the teachers of the law were offended by Jesus when he healed people on the Sabbath, because healing could be considered work. It's why they got upset when Jesus commanded the uh, man who had been a paralytic uh, to pick up his mat and walk, uh, because picking something up could be considered work. Uh, and Jesus's re response to this kind of interpretation of the law was, man is not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. In other words, the Sabbath is not supposed to be this pain for human beings. The Sabbath is supposed to be something that gives human beings life, something that is a gift, something to enjoy. Uh, you're not supposed to go throughout the Sabbath wondering if every little thing you do could be considered work. The Sabbath is a gift, a day of relaxation and recreation where God says, you know, take, take some time off from doing uh, the work that you need to do to uh, survive and to make money and all that sort of thing and just enjoy a day. So Jesus's interpretation of the Sabbath is an example of why his yoke is easy and his burden is light. The teachers of the law during Jesus's day, they had very burdensome yokes. If you put on their yoke, well, you better not even pick berries off of a bush on the Sabbath because that's kind of close to farming and farming is work, right? So that's a heavy yoke to carry, but Jesus's yoke was easy. Jesus summarized the whole law as love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So, you know, if 
it's the Sabbath and you come across someone who's in need of healing and they're suffering and you have the ability to heal them, you don't ask, oh, is this work? You ask yourself, what's the loving thing to do for my neighbor right now? And if that's the way you're thinking, the answer is clear. Jesus' yoke is easy because it's not obsessed with uh, religious minutia. It's not obsessed with the letter of the law. Its concern is the heart of the law, the intent of the law. And the heart of the law is love God and love your neighbor. It's not real complicated, right? It's not rocket science. It's not quantum mechanics. Uh, it is a light yoke. But it's still a yoke that requires that we give up control. It still requires dying to self. The way Jesus puts it uh, elsewhere is it, it requires us picking up our crosses. And many of us have a hard time doing that. Maybe you have a hard time doing that. Uh, maybe there's some part of you that recoils at this idea of, of putting on uh, Jesus's yoke. But what I'd like us to realize this morning is that we will wear a yoke, whether it's Jesus's or not, uh, because something is going to be our master. Something is going to be our Lord. We can't really escape that. Your yoke could be your career. Some people have given their career complete authority over their lives. Uh, their career determines everything. Uh, their sense of value and worth is completely uh, dependent on success in their career. And that's not a light yoke. That's a burdensome yoke. It's heavy. It's unforgiving. Uh, there's a lot of different things that your yoke could be. Your yoke could be a political agenda. Uh, your yoke could be your physical appearance, trying to maintain uh, physical beauty or, or fitness. Your yoke could be uh, safety, just always trying to uh, eliminate all risk in your life and, and preserve your life. Uh, your, your yoke could be trying to get revenge on someone who wronged you or uh, trying to preserve your honor. Your yoke could be just trying to acquire as much wealth as possible. Uh, your yoke could be sex, your yoke could be drugs and alcohol. There's a lot of possible yokes that we could attach ourselves to. And uh, these, are, these are the things that we look to for happiness and for a sense of worth and value in the world. Uh, we all wanna feel good, we all wanna feel like we're significant, like we matter. And so we put on these yokes and we serve these things like, like they're our, our lords. And what we need to realize is that these are burdensome yokes. They don't satisfy us. And like the author of Ecclesiastes says, they are like chasing after the wind, like trying to grab onto smoke. Ultimately, they are not satisfying. There's a really great quote from a man named David Foster Wallace that recognizes this. David Foster Wallace, he was a university professor. Uh, he was, uh, he's often regarded as one of the greatest writers of the last 30 years, 40 years. Um, and as far as I know, he was, did not identify as a Christian. He actually had a troubled life. He was, uh, seemed to just, struggle with depression because he took his own life when he was only 46 years old. Um, but he said something very insightful, something that I think the writer of Ecclesiastes would agree with and something that I think Jesus would agree with as well. He said, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism because there is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God 
or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you'll never have enough. You'll never feel like you have enough. It's the truth. If you worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, then you'll always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power and you will feel weak and afraid. And you'll need ever more power over others to keep that fear at bay. Worship your intellect being seen as smart then you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, like you're always on the verge of being found out, and so on. What David Foster Wallace recognized there is that we all put on a yoke, and most of those yokes are not kind to us. You know, to put it metaphorically, most of those yokes uh, that we put on, they just, they drag us until they break our necks. They are, they're burdensome. And, and Wallace recognizes, you know, the only kind of yoke that wouldn't do that would have to be something like God. And that's what Jesus said too. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And I love the way he puts it. For I am gentle and humble in heart. Most of those yokes that we put on, like David Foster Wallace said, they're not gentle, right? They will eat us alive. They make us die a million deaths. But Jesus is gentle. When we attach ourselves to Jesus and we yield control to him, he graciously guides us. And uh, as Psalm 23 says, he leads us beside the still waters and restores our souls. He gives us good work to do, the kind of work that lasts as we partner with him in making the world more like heaven and helping to uh, guide people to the kingdom of God. Uh, he, he gives us meaningful work as we partner with him to uh, make the world more just and to bring reconciliation uh, wherever we go. And whenever we try to go in the wrong direction, if we are yoked to him, then he gently tugs us back on course. And ultimately, he guides us all the way to eternal life. So my encouragement this morning is simple. My encouragement is if we are feeling burdened, if we are feeling tired, if we are weary, uh, Let's make sure we're wearing the right yoke. Let's make sure we've got the right one on. And if we've got the wrong one on, let's take it off and let's put on Jesus's yoke. Let's learn to love him and to love our neighbor. And let's move where he moves. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this invitation that you welcome us and, and you say to us, if you are tired, Lord, I mean, you just say, come, come to me. Um, take off that burdensome yoke and put on one that will actually give you life. Lord, we thank you for that invitation. And Lord, I pray if any of us have um, started to wear the wrong yoke, uh, that we would recognize that and that we would trade it in for yours. Lord, help us to uh, partner with you, to move where you move, uh, to attach ourselves to you. We thank you for uh, your welcome, and uh, we pray for rest for our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to play a reflection song, uh, and then we'll transition to a time of communion. You can't.
came to set the captives free. You came to bring us liberty. My sin and my rejection met your blood and my acceptance. Now I'm alive to bring you praise. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Every chain is broken through you, Jesus. met your blood and my acceptance. Now I'm alive to bring you praise. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And every chain So before we shift into communion, um, just want to make a couple quick announcements. Hopefully you've been reading the what's happening email. And uh, if you don't receive the what's happening email and you'd like to, it's, a, it's a, a weekly email that just informs you on what's going on with our church. Um, and we'd love for you to receive it. So if you're interested, email Keith at stpaulswire.org and he would be happy to add you to the list. But 
A couple things that you would find there if you read that this week is we have a few events coming up. So uh, one is on July 24th, Friday, July 24th, uh, starting at 7 p.m. We're going to be doing a special live stream. Uh, it's, it's called Pursuing Racial Righteousness. It'll be an evening of teaching and Q&A uh, with a man named Bishop Stephen Hodge, who is a pastor of a, a church in uh, Hartford. Uh, he is an a African-American man, uh, and he's been in ministry for um, over 30 years, I believe. And um, we thought that in the interest of helping to understand this cultural moment that we're in and in um, promoting understanding across uh, racial lines in the church, that it would be great to hear from Bishop Hodge. Um, and so uh, the way that's going to go is he's going to teach. And then I'm going to do a little interview with him, ask him some questions, and then uh, hopefully we will open it up to Q&A uh, for anybody who is on the live stream who wants to ask uh, Bishop Hodge questions. Uh, so I really encourage you to participate in that. Uh, that'll be again Friday, July 24th at 7 p.m. Uh, we also uh, have another event coming up on August 1st where we will be meeting on the Willington Town Green um, to pray uh, for our nation and for the world. Uh, we're inviting other churches to participate and um, we will be uh, praying for justice, praying for, for unity and praying for peace. So that'll be an organized time of prayer. Uh, it shouldn't run longer than an hour, um, probably around 45 minutes. And we uh, encourage you to participate in that. Masks are required. Uh, that'll be August 1st, uh, 5 to 6 p.m. So I uh, would love to have you participate in these events if you can and if you are comfortable uh, participating. So uh, as you know, if you have been participating on our live stream um, throughout the last three and a half months, we have been doing communion. Uh, and uh, this is one of the ways that we express our unity as the body of Christ, even when we are separated physically. Um, and it's one of the ways that we are obedient to Christ's command to remember him. Uh, he said, this is the way I want you to remember me and to remember my sacrifice on your behalf uh, is through this sacred ritual. So every week we invite uh, you to find something akin to the elements in your home and participate with us um, in Holy Communion. So one of the ways that we express that we want to take off the, the bad yokes and put on Jesus's yoke is by participating in this, uh, this ritual, this sacred ritual. Um, this is a way of saying, I am tired, I am weary, I am burdened by the world, and I know that the only place that I can go for life is by attaching myself to you, Jesus. And uh, so I encourage you as you participate this morning, if you are participating, to think of it in that way, that this is one of the ways that I express I want to put on Jesus's yoke. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes again.
mind that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I last he has ransomed me his grace runs deep while i was a slave to sin jesus died for me yes he died for me forsaken I am who you say I am you are for me not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen not forsaken I am who you say I am you are for me not against me I am who you say I am Jesus, if there are any of us this morning who have a hard time saying that, I'm a child of God, yes, I am, help us to recognize that you are inviting us to come and find rest through you. Lord, may we put on your yoke and move where you move and find the peace that our souls need. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for joining us this morning and uh, stay, stay tuned, look, <laughs> listen for messages uh, from us to find out about whether or not in-person uh, worship will resume next week. Um, but whatever the case, the live stream, of course, will still be going. So let's say our benediction. While our service has ended, our worship has not ended because our worship never ends. Now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord 
and to love and serve his people. Thanks be to God. Amen.